welcome to the Move Daily Health Podcast, where we share information to empower you to be your own health hero. Welcome back to the Move Daily Health Podcast. I'm Dane Wallace here again with Freya Spence, and this is episode three of season two. And today we're going to talk about how to change your stimulus to change your life. So this is going to be a nice follow up to last week when we discussed the nuances of listening to the body. So to quickly recap some homework from that episode uh, with on the movement side of things was to check in with your body on a daily basis to help you better manage your output for the day. Now, Freya also gave you a nice little system in that episode for that, so be sure to go back and check that out if you get the chance. On the nutrition side of things, the homework was to start tracking the what you were eating and linking that back to your body's feedback. So today, we're going to dig in to some of the inputs and outputs to, outputs to dig down a little bit deeper into that um, to try and explain why some things are happening. So today's episode is for anyone who wants to improve their health. And as always, you can find us on our website at movewelldaily.com or on Instagram at move underscore daily underscore EDS. So Freya, what do we mean when we say inputs versus outputs? Well, with the inputs, we have big rocks and little rocks. And most people, if you're already listening to this podcast, would know that two of your major inputs are movement and nutrition. And movement and nutrition are... the top reasons that people will come and hire coaches or or practitioners, but they only represent a fraction of the other inputs. And in fact, some of the other inputs are more frequent than the time spent moving or the time spent eating in someone's day. So what that would be is, is sleep, for example, or even the input of work. We can also look at other big rocks these days like news and social media. If you're spending six hours a day reading the news uh, cumulatively, then that input is likely a bigger one than the time spent eating or the time spent moving. So when we talk about inputs, it's very much a whole systems approach to figuring out what are the things going into that person's organism, because we are not separate. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. But you can delineate between the big rocks in your life and the little rocks by time spent. So there are also the big rocks that are foundations to being a human, movement, sleep, eating, and then obviously in our in our society we have community as well. Uh, we have stillness. Those are general big rocks that will help somebody thrive. But then we have other ones that if you spend a lot of time doing them for you personally, those would be considered big rock inputs. Uh, I gave the example of news already. Social media is right up there with it. Uh, the people that you may spend a lot more time with could be your personal big rocks, and then they're all the smaller ones, the things that you do occasionally or that have less of a time commitment, less of an energy commitment. They're still inputs, but they're perhaps not as impactful as some of the other ones. So you could put uh, supplements in that category, for example, Um, some other small rock inputs. Maybe you see a friend that you're not a super big fan of, but you see them once a year, so it's not really a big deal. So those would be the small rock inputs. And we try to picture everything that goes into one person's overall load of inputs. And Dane, can you tell us what outputs are? So if those are inputs, I'm (laughs) guessing most people can kind of figure out that once you have the inputs, you're going to get something coming out the other end. So we have outputs, which are both really the goals that we hope to achieve and really the outcomes of any behaviors or thing that happened to us within our environment. So some of the major ones that we deal with in terms of outcomes or um, outputs are health, for example, versus illness, uh, weight loss versus weight gain, um, mood, energy versus fatigue, sleep as well, performance, productivity. All of these things are the outputs that are directly the result of all of the daily uh, inputs that are impacting us. So Freya, to change any part of your life, you have to change your stimulus, stimulus, which means changing one or some of your inputs. Stimulus. Stimulus. Good grief. Uh, a CH in there for uh, the people at home. We'll put that in the uh, subtitles. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so when it comes to evaluating your inputs, um, what we focus on is, is actually in, in our household, we talk about what does your organism require? Because every organism, meaning you as a human, interacts with its environment. You are 
not separate from it. And every organism responds slightly differently to a very identical environment. Case in point, Dane and I lived in the same space. I got super sick. He did not get sick. We figured out ultimately that there was a a mold issue because of a massive leak in that home. He got away with maybe a little bit of GI distress. I had some congestion. Some congestion, a little bit less happy gut, but not unhappy. But my system, uh, in, in part due to the porous nature that comes with EDS, was completely sidelined. And so it didn't matter what other inputs I was doing. I was attempting to sleep. I was attempting to move. I was attempting... Um, you know, to to resolve nutritional things. And I was building more intolerances and more reactivity, which I, you know, already get uh, hand in hand with EDS. So the point of that is that we were both living in the same environment. I was focusing on all of these inputs that are very positive towards health, and they could not override the fact that I was in a moldy environment. Granted, we didn't know that at the time. I just knew I'm doing all the things that I know are supportive to my health, and I'm really quite sick right now. So that's an example. I know it's an extreme one, but it is still a relevant one because when we start with comparing ourselves to our our peers, our friends, people that we see online, we have to understand that our organism is interacting with its environment and the way it's interacting with its environment might be different than someone else who's in technically a very similar environment or even the exact same one. And so that's a a key piece when it comes to understanding that. Now, the other other piece that we want people to to do, apart from observing their inputs and their desired outputs, is to also take a look at the filter that we would apply to our desired output. So what I mean by that is if my goal, that could be considered an output, is to achieve a promotion at work, and I'm picking these off the top of my head, run a sub 3.30 marathon. If those are my desired outputs, then I need to then apply the filter of what does that person look like who can achieve those things. If my goal is to lift 500 pounds on a deadlift, that's a very big physical output, but all the other pieces of someone's environment have to go into creating that. So we need to apply the filter. What things do you think can lead to that output in your life? And, and this is where, you know, having a coach, we can't be explicit on the instructions here. We're trying to present you with ideas and concepts because having a coach can help with that because a coach can apply different filters to you and help you suss out exactly what you'd have to do. But it is good to go through that process when you think about the outputs that you want and then backtrack and think, okay, to get there, what sort of inputs does my system need? If someone's saying, I want to sleep eight hours a night, but they're busy partying until 2.30 in the morning, at what stage are you going to change your input so that you can get eight hours of night and still get up on time for work or other commitments? And it would just be a very objective way of seeing, oh, you know what, my actions, my inputs are out of line with what my desired output is. And so you can backtrack because it is, it is cyclical in, in that nature. And um, that's what we work with a lot of people on because social media does a really good job at, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes creating connections, but sometimes creating a, a false idea that extremes are the only way forward and that you need to either overhaul your life or change absolutely nothing and still get your desired output. And Dane can speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, evaluating your inputs that you think are required for desired outcome um, requires taking quite an objective and honest view of where you're currently at and then recognizing where you might be missing information or even have misinformation. So it requires kind of parking the ego and kind of parking belief sometimes and removing emotion and judgment from that equation. So this is really, really the hardest part for people when it comes to trying to figure out what inputs are the ones that might be holding them back from achieving the goals that they're trying to achieve. Um, And so when you get into a place where you might not be achieving a goal and you're just kind of spinning your wheels instead of taking that objective look about, okay, well, I was worried about this, but maybe I should be worrying about these other inputs. 
if you, if you don't have that objective lens, then you can fall into the trap of judging yourself and just thinking, oh, I have failed, I don't know what I'm doing, and that can create this negative cycle, like almost like a negative shame and fail cycle where you just keep going around and around. So keeping that objective, non-emotional filter is really important, and that's where, again, what Freya just mentioned, if you can bring in a health professional or somebody to give you that second eye, uh, that is invaluable for a lot of people because it can save you a lot of time and really make sure that you stay out of that whole issue where you might be judging yourself for absolutely no reason. And this is where the inputs of social support systems and social media, as Freya just mentioned, really come into play and really become crucial um, because you have to sit down and ask, like, these inputs that might be very, very strong, if you think about it, think about, you know, the five people you spend the most time with and think about how much time you spend scrolling Instagram or on Facebook and taking in all of that information. And again, all that information, I'll remind you, is not fact-checked. <laughs> it's all just information that's coming in. You don't know if it's true or if it's something you should apply within your context. Um, you have to see, is this information helping me set realistic expectations or is it making things feel impossible, right? Um, to return to the previously mentioned points, like we find people have a harder and harder, harder time imagining what it would take to get to their desired outcome because of how many quick fixes they might see on Instagram, for example, or like, you know, these transformations that were seemingly so easy, but they don't know, you know, 95% of the details that really went into that plan. Um, and there's just so many extremes online and things can be perpetuated even by close friends who might, you know, they might not be giving you all the details and their situation might be totally different. As Freya said, like, maybe one of you is living in a moldy home. We don't know that, right? So there's all these different inputs that when you do have a secondary voice to help you with or when you can take an objective outcome and really kind of block out some of the noise that's coming from social media, um, that's when you can really get better output. So um, again, it's just about staying objective and when you can bring in a second voice um, to try and help you with that filter because that emotional thing is really, really hard and social media is really a big problem right now, especially with mental health and it can cause a lot of uh, people to kind of give up really, really quickly um, even though they haven't explored a lot of their other options. Sorry, I need to pause because a thought came into my head. <laughs> it took me down a different rabbit hole. That's totally fair. <laughs> uh, well, uh, th and this brings us to the whole chicken and egg side of inputs and outputs is uh, they, they feed into each other because everything can create a cyclical reaction. So, for example, the example I gave a minute ago about sleep. If I want to improve my sleep, and I, my goal is to get more energy, uh, to have higher performance markers. And when I say performance, I know I've qualified this before. I'll qualify it again for any new listeners. That can mean the capacity to live your daily life without uh, you know, as much difficulty. And that can also mean athletic feats. It's everything in between. It's whatever is personal to your life, that is your performance. That is your function. When people say, oh, it's a functional exercise your life actually determines what's functional <laughs> within it. And so the, the whole chicken and egg of, of sleep in this context is if I'm constantly sacrificing sleep, a paucity of sleep will lead to higher caffeine consumption in some individuals. It might also lead to, for lack of a better word, uh, shittier food choices because you have lower energy. You have lower executive function, so you don't even have the the executive function or motivation or willpower to do certain things. Uh, in particular, take care of yourself. So you might put other priorities first, and that takes up all of the energy motivation that you had available to you, and you wind up at the bottom of that list. That shitty food <laughs> and that higher caffeine and that stress state can lead you to spend your entire day in a, a more elevated stress state, which can lead to mouth breathing, and then if we spend our whole day in that state mouth breathing, when we get to sleep at night, we are sleeping in a way that is shallow. If we're mouth breathing at that point in time, you'll notice you'll wake up with headaches. You'll potentially wake up. Uh, this is If you wake up with like a parched mouth, that's probably a sign. You might wake up feeling oddly anxious or irritated and not know why. You might get eight or nine hours and feel really horrible as if you didn't really sleep at all. 
So just that, that one output, which was sacrificed sleep, if it goes on cyclically, can lead to all of these other factors. Then when you add into it the other elements, you might have less motivation to move or less energy to move, which is totally fair. But then you don't move, and if that keeps going on chronically, you might start experiencing more pain because our joints need movement, and we need high nutrient-dense foods as often as we are able to manage in our life to take care of our system. So you can start to see how the inputs and outputs can feed forward into one another, which is why it can be so difficult for somebody to change just one singular input, because they actually have to gain a significant amount of momentum, and some of that is just being able to objectively see, you know what, that is the one singular habit, sorry, choking on my own throat, singular habit that I need to target and tackle right now. That's why extremes don't often lead to sustainability. In some personality types, they do, and that's great. And, and in others, they really don't. They result in more types of crashing and burning, and the sense that you cannot overcome the, the place that you're in, which is incorrect, because all of us have some element of choice and change available to us in our environment, and it does not mean that you need to overhaul your life and live like one of your peers or, or whatnot. You try to find the one that will carry the biggest impact and then be a catalyst to all of these other ones. And we, we know that if you are not moving and you're not sleeping, pain sensitivity is higher. If you don't know how to interpret that pain sensitivity or why it came about, then somebody might develop fear avoidance behaviors when it comes to movement. Somebody might uh, cite that they, they need to go on supplements like B12 without realizing you, you haven't been tested. You don't know whether you have a B12 deficiency. You just put yourself on that. When really the fix was that you should be sleeping a little bit more. If you're really tired, don't drink caffeine. <laughs> Most people uh, don't like it when we say that. But that was something that we learned is if you're sleep deprived, that's the night or that's the day to actually not have caffeine. Do your best not to. Or if you do have it, just have a really small amount and eat before you do because that will also influence um, cortisol. And when we talk about breathing, people think, oh, that's way too simple. But it's a massive piece that can change all of your outputs. And it can also allow your good inputs, whatever good input, I'm not trying to label things as good or bad because what's good for one person like Dane is different than what's good for me. I almost knocked my water over. That would have been awesome. <laughs> that would have been awesome because I've told Dane to move his glass so that he doesn't knock it over. It's now on my left hand <laughs> side, so I'm trying to drink water with my left hand because if you've paid attention to previous episodes, I have spilled water on myself with my right hand, and we're just trying to avoid any mishaps, whether that water yep. goes on me or my computer. So if it happened to her, I mean, you guys get it. Do they, though? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to the conversation at hand. <laughs> Where was I? So uh, if, if you have inputs in your life... Say you're, you're eating really well, you're getting daily movement in, you're getting weekly exercise in that you enjoy, but you have all these other big rocks that are sacrificed. You can just adjust one, and all of a sudden, all those other inputs that are positive to your physiology, to your organism, actually carry much more weight to them. So a little input like a s supplement isn't necessary for you. Also, so many people take B vitamins without having been tested, and they don't understand that they all work in balance, just like everything else in our system. And you can take enough to put yourself into a toxic state, which is definitely not what you want. So that's where looking objectively and taking the emotion out of it is very hard, especially for things just like coffee. <laughs> people sometimes get defensive that they need that, and we're not trying to criticize anyone. We've both been in states where we're consuming too much of something that we know is not necessarily in our best interest, and it's a stopgap to get through a phase, which brings me to, to the movement piece. But Dane, you want to interject? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to jump in really quick there. Um, just kind of touch base on that, because some inputs are very reactionary. So you just mentioned supplements, you just mentioned coffee. And those are reactionary inputs to the fact that you do not have good energy and that you're probably just not getting enough sleep. And so again, that is like, it, it's tracing the domino back. Like if you know, you're defensive about coffee and you have terrible energy, it's like, well, why, is, why do you feel so emotional and personal about that coffee thing? 
like, what is the actual input that we need to address here? Is it the focus on not having coffee? Or should that efforts really be put into how can I get better sleep? Because then, you know, not having coffee might seem a lot easier. And, you know, just to kind of further follow up to the supplements piece, yeah, supplements are maybe going to give you 5% of something. I mean, it's why they're called supplements. They're to supplement your daily behaviors and habits. They're not the be all end all. They're not going to resolve any issues for absolutely anyone. Typically, if somebody wants to take a supplement, like a B supplement, for example, I will, and, and, and they're working with me, and they're asking for my opinion. <laughs> I will, again, I don't recommend supplements, but instead I'll say, if you want to take that, that's fair, but please make sure you're taking that supplement with a whole food that contains that vitamin. So if you're going to take a B supplement, make sure you're taking that with, you know, some, some red meat or some spinach, for example. Like, make sure you're actually giving yourself the core compound and trying to groove the habit that's going to really take hold there instead of just relying on something that you're just throwing into your body and then feeling good about making the problem better, even though it's still really just a Band-Aid solution. And supplements cost a lot. They're so expensive, <laughs> man. And there are some good ones. And for, for my particular system, I take more than Dane does. And I have been recommended dozens <laughs> over the course of the last 15 years of, of my life working with various professionals. And at one point, I walked away from... Uh, a practitioner's office with a prescription for $500 worth of supplements that will last me three weeks. And all I could think was, I can't keep doing this. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm renting my body because the amount of expenses that are adding up every single month is surmounting literally what I pay for rent and um, or overriding what I pay for rent. And our, our focus is, as in, you know, individuals and as professionals has been on dialing in the full picture of what these inputs and outputs are. And we're not the ones to prescribe supplements. We will help people with the rest of their life and movement and nutrition and understanding all of those inputs and desired outputs and how they create a feedback loop. So that if somebody decides, you know what, I don't actually feel any different taking this one thing or, or five things, then great. It means that your body got what it needed from its environment and that's phenomenal. Supplements really are supposed to be that drop in the bucket can, that can really help you, you know, get that little edge. And in certain circumstances, like with EDS, I find that there are certain supplements because we don't absorb things well, particularly well, even when our guts are as healthy as they can be, that a few make a huge difference. But when we're still in a deficit gut-wise, now all of a sudden we need a ton and our body's not doing a great job at absorbing any of those. So it just is the equivalent of flushing money down the toilet. Yeah, a little, a little hack here for you is uh, check your supplement budget, check your grocery budget. If supplements are bigger than your grocery bucket, you may want to try and alter that ratio. The whole food, if you are spending more money on quality whole foods, that is going to pay off so much more in the long run than just throwing supplements into your body. So there's a Quick little hack for you. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to movement and inputs, obviously exercise is an, a very obvious one, whether somebody is in athletics, whether they're going to the gym, whether they're just doing their own thing at home, all of that is considered an input. And um, we also have a lot of movement outside of that because we have bodies. <laughs> I touched on this with an IG, or sorry, in an IG Live with Mike Fitch the other week when we were discussing injuries and we were discussing the concept of being broken or part of a body being quote unquote bad. And uh, see, I did both the bunny quotes and the verbal one that time just for our listeners to see and hear. <laughs> As I was reaching across my body with my right hand to grab my glass, anyway. Good job. We're really good at handing out gold stars for ourselves around here, so. <laughs> Sorry. Suffice it to say, we were discussing the concept of broken or bad. And a lot of people will label their bodies in, in really negative terms that don't serve them and that are not correct. Your body isn't bad. It's responding to whatever the stimulus or stimuli are around you. So even with me, when I wasn't well in that example we gave you earlier with the mold toxicity and building up more and more, you know, reactions, allergic reactions, neurological pain, tons of stuff was happening. 
And I knew this isn't because my body's bad. It is having a hard time with something. And we just need to figure out what on earth that is. And that can be many different things. At other phases in, in my life, especially when it comes to movement, I was always up really early. I had a hard time sleeping past 3 or 3.30. And so I'd be in the gym at 4.30 in the morning and then I would go and work. And sometimes that work involved travel. It was usually all around Canada, which you know isn't that far. Uh, it is still a load on the body. And I would come home at night from, from work and I might eat at around 7 or 8 p.m. And then I'd rinse and repeat the whole cycle. From an outside perspective, it would appear that my inputs were really good because I exercised regularly, I had a very active job, which I actually didn't even consider in my inputs for quite some time, and I ate really well. I still was really not well. So that's the hard part is figuring out when we're doing all the things that we think we need to be doing we need to just step back and understand if maybe that input was, was it too much or am I lacking? It's always a balance of things. Am I lacking something else? So in that context, I was lacking sleep and I was lacking recovery. And a lot of coaches fall into this. Uh, certain types of athletes will fall into this too. I find endurance athletes will often fall into this category, whether they're coaches or not, is doing more because you feel like if I stop now, when you start to notice performance going down, the thought is often, oh, I can't stop now. I've put in all of these hours or I've put in all of those days. I've gotten up early all of those mornings. And when we start to see performance going down, it is unquestionably not because your training is off. <laughs> it's because your recovery is off. You can only train as hard as you can recover. And that recovery, again, the, the input isn't just from exercise. So even if you have enough in the tank to handle the exercise, which I thought I did at the time and seemed to be okay with but was noticing some performance going down I had neglected to take into account that my entire job was incredibly active and there were points in time when I was traveling to three different locations within the city either by foot or by bike and that's incredibly active I wasn't even counting that towards one of my movement inputs just like when somebody is, is stuck at a computer all day in a high stress state, we've touched on this before, that is a movement input of sorts. It's not movement, <laughs> it's staticness, but it is a bodily input. And when you're, when you're observing your own inputs there, you need to gauge where you are on that massive spectrum. Am I doing too much? Do I need to reel it back? Am I not doing enough? Because if I don't do enough, if you feel kind of crummy, and, you know, you're getting joint stiffness, you think that you're getting old, as we touched on last week, which, you know, we've heard some 20-year-olds say, and you don't, you look at your life, and if you look at it throughout the course of the day, you don't have a whole lot of input as far as variability in your movement, then you need to apply a little bit more movement because that's going to feed forward into better sleep. So all of the big rocks, uh, there's a lot of nuance here, as you can tell, but all of those big rocks feed into each other. On the other hand, if you have a really active job, if you are exercising a lot and you're starting to notice performance metrics, whether in life, activity, whatever it is, are going down a little, you need to take a look at where you're biasing your recovery. Are you recovering hard enough? Is your sleep on point, which we touched on last time too? Uh, are you doing soft tissue and mobility? I know that Dane, for example, when he when we first met, he thought his recovery was perfect because he stretched a little bit before and after his workouts. But all of the other days and hours in the week didn't involve any sort of body care. It was just kind of like be in a car, be in meetings, uh, be sitting at home working. But my echo chamber was my echo chamber was other strongman athletes, and I knew I was doing a lot more than most other people. So within what I had surrounded myself with. I thought I was the best and just doing everything right. But again, this is where when you seek an outside opinion, you can really get better answers. <laughs> and so sometimes it's big things like I'm, you know, training way too much every single day. And then other times it's just those little very frequent things that are happening. And it's, it's like scratching the um, or picking the scab as it were. And it will just keep that wound just a little bit open and irritated. And 
people are, are best at observing their own life, but they have to step back in order to do so. So we've, we've had clients who have no idea why they're exhausted, why their performance is going down, why their pain is going up, why their di digestion is going sideways. And the more and more we dig into it, they've adapted over years. They've slowly shrunk their, their sleep to be a tinier and tinier window. And there are a lot of different thoughts that have perpetuated this. And in one case, extreme case, she's going to bed at 1 in the morning, getting up at 5 to go to boot camps. Well, you know, I, I don't know any age group that will really benefit from that, but there have been thoughts like the four-hour body that was released a long time ago, and I understand that uh, Tim Ferriss has done some great things. That book was not a great thing no. in, in, as a coach because I had people who were – coming in saying that all they're going to eat are legumes. Okay, fine. Do you like legumes? Do you know how to prepare them well? Do you take the time to prepare them well? Do they sit well with your system? And are you getting enough variability around that? Others who thought that they could uh, sleep in bouts of 20 minutes, I'm not kidding, instead of getting sleep at night. Okay, well, <laughs> sure, that might work for, I don't know, 0.001% of the population, no. but it's biased data that he presented it with. And it, we know much more about sleep now that hopefully a lot of people aren't buying into that. But again, it was one of those, uh, those things that had a massive ripple effect because it was widely publicized and marketed. And all of a sudden, people had seen it on the news, seen it on social media, instead of having a really big understanding of why not to do those things, they're trying it on for size anyway. And uh, there were a lot of us who were talking clients off ledges of like, that's not going to work for you. That's going to make you sick. How are you going to have, like, manage your family while taking 20-minute naps instead of sleeping at night. And look at the, the big picture. So someone's the best person, a client, a person is the best person to really look at all of the inputs of their day, but a coach could, or a practitioner can certainly help them figure out what to look at. Because a lot of things that people do, like the woman I mentioned who gradually sh shrunk her sleeping window over the course of a couple of decades, she'd normalize it so much that she actually didn't even realize that wasn't necessarily the best thing for her physiology anymore because our bodies are just adaptable mm -hmm. whatever you do is considered practice everything you do is practice and the more you practice it the more automated it becomes and sometimes we become even less aware of it which is where we need outside viewpoints to to jump in if that thing is no longer serving us or if we're unhappy with an output so what i've discussed inputs when it comes to movements but the output would be your own personal performance metrics. And my big ask is, are you able to physically do what you want to do? And are you able to live your life with as few limitations as possible? Because I understand this is very different for some people. Uh, shortly, I, I just got a reminder of this, three years ago was the day that I celebrated <laughs> I celebrated being able to carry a backpack again because for quite a long time I hadn't been able to because of my spine injury and it still isn't the best thing for me and I certainly can't load it heavily. But I celebrated that fact because I was home from Australia, Dane wasn't, and I had to put groceries in the fridge. And it took me three trips on three separate days to get enough groceries so that when Dane did come home the next day, there was enough in there for both of us until we could do a full shop. For me, that was a massive performance metric because it required walking, which you know I don't have a problem with, but I have had to retrain several times in my life. And it required carrying things, which took a lot of rehabilitation and time. So to me, that's a huge output metric. My output was goal was to try to be as independent as possible and it's just like when throughout that that injury when Dane would which was very prolonged when Dane would help me out he goes I know you're a strong independent woman but what does your organism require and so you know we try to I know it's a bit tongue-in-cheek but it is also very real so if your performance metric and output is one that relies on like that marathon that I mentioned earlier sub 330 Look at where you're at, look at where your performance is trending over a lot of different data sets, and look to see whether all of the outputs, energy-wise, mentally, and so on, are saying that your inputs are good, that they're all a big, big feedback loop. And what I'll encourage everyone to do in terms of measuring both is, is understanding 
that strength and and well-being and health is multifaceted and hopefully by now you guys know that well so when we say take a look at your inputs look at literally everything that goes into your eyes into your body and into your brain and is around you when we talk about outputs don't consider just what you would like to do physically from an athletic standpoint or a gym standpoint look at what your life demands are we spoke about health span versus lifespan last time, and we have met some very strong individuals who sadly cannot raise their arms overhead to put things in a cupboard because their shoulders and T-spines are so shot, or their arms go numb when they're lying on their back at night. Those are output, well, they're sort of forms of feedback, but that's an output measure. And that doesn't line up. You may be really strong in your sport, but there are other things that we need to look at. Because from a life standpoint, sure, you've got this performance metric with a barbell, but now from a life standpoint, the performance metrics are going down. So just make sure that you're, you're looking at all of them because we're, we realize we're physical beings and we cannot just delineate to performance being what we do in the gym. And a lot of people don't need to be in the gym to be perfectly healthy, and that's fine. If you don't like the gym, don't. <laughs> but look at your life from the standpoint of something you can train, something you can practice for, and something that's an accumulation of all the various points of stimulus throughout your day. With that in mind, the, the last way to really also gauge your inputs and outputs is to, <laughs> I have a habit of doing this, of asking people to give certain parts of themselves a voice. So if your body did have a voice, and at the end of the day, someone asked you what you did that day, and you list off like 20 things, but then somebody asked your body what you did that day, what it did that day, and your body says, well, I sat in a chair, and then went into a different chair shape. And then I went into another chair shape and got food. That's very, very little input from a positional standpoint. And our joints thrive off of movement. They need it to stay healthy. So does your brain. We retain executive function. We retain willpower, motivation, uh, you name it. To, and mental acuity, which I don't seem to have right now. <laughs> we retain all of that through movement. So it, that, that can also help people be a little bit objective when they realize that, oh, you know what, my brain did all of these things and it took on all of these things. It, it absorbed all of this information. And my body actually, if I ask it, only existed in a few different positions throughout the day. That gives you information in terms of what your overall health output will be long term if that is consistently the story. Remember, this is all about things done consistently. We all have days where we're not super proud of the inputs and outputs. That's totally fine. <laughs> it's more about what your overall trend is and your overall goal. All right. Thank you, Freya. That was uh, a lot on movement. And uh, I think we'll get into more movement later regarding homework that we'll give out. But for now, I'm going to go into a little bit about nutrition and speak to things on that side because again these are the two although there are a ton of different inputs um, movement and nutrition are the two biggest ones that people tend to come to us with and we kind of branch out from there so one of the things that we see the most often within our society is that when it comes to inputs for nutrition people are often just outsourcing their attention to diets so whether that's a low carb diet a keto paleo or otherwise People are just outsourcing to these blanket rules. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these approaches, but outsourcing to these diets puts a focus on just that one thing, which is these rules that are for absolutely everyone. So I used to follow a pretty strict diet when I was competing in Strongman. And the thing with diets is that you can get lean and jacked and strong by just following these blanket rules and not listening to your body, I was a very strong, very lean strongman athlete, and I was ignoring everything my body was telling me, and even though I looked good and performed well, I mean, I was never fully rested. I didn't feel good. I snored like crazy every night. <laughs> For <it's> like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Frankly, Doing what I did with that diet, which was basically saving the vast majority of my calories from very, very late in the day, really screwed up my sleep and my circadian rhythms. And so that left me feeling exhausted every morning. So in the morning I'd wake up, I would have a full French press to myself because, again, I read some studies that said coffee is super good for you. So, of course, more is always better, right? 
Nope. I learned over time that that is definitely not a thing. <laughs> um, because of the coffee, my digestion was an absolute mess as well. And I was like, no, it's totally fine. Then I went to the doctor and I realized also my blood markers were a mess. So I had low testosterone, strange for a guy who's very muscular and very strong. And my blood pressure was super high. And again, these were all things I just completely ignored. Even the blood pressure I was like, well, oh, whatever. My dad and my grandmother have high blood pressure. So it's probably just my genetics, right? It's nothing that I'm doing wrong because look at me, I'm lean and I'm strong. So I could easily write all that off. But that's the problem with diets is you can follow these strict rules and get to a certain place, but that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be consequences eventually, right? And you have to remember when I was doing this, I was in my late 20s. And if you're younger than 30, frankly, you're going to get away with a lot of stuff. And then you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, it gets, you know, more prevalent (laughs) with age. But you start getting feedback and start feeling things that you're like, hey, why is that happening? So when you don't try to understand what your body is saying, you really gloss over this really important feedback and you neglect how other pieces of feedback are impacting your ultimate results. So... When it comes to nutrition, this is why I never really recommend strict diets. It's not something that I help people with. If people want to do it, by all means, go for it. Do your thing. It can be a nice learning curve for people to just be like, hey, this is kind of mindless. I'm figuring out my portions. I feel I can learn, you know, what foods actually feel good. Um, But ultimately, you're not going to follow that for the long term because, you know, people like to take vacations. They like to go do social things. These are not really long-term solutions. And if it's not a long-term solution, your results are not going to be sustainable either. And so you can then get into that negative feedback loop that I spoke about before where it's like, oh, I, got, I lost 10 pounds. Oh, I gained 10 pounds. You know, it's, it's not a great place to be. So here are a few impact, uh, sorry, inputs that I would recommend people kind of look at. And the number one input I would say would be the level of processing of food. So food can be a whole food, single ingredient. So for example, an apple, that is... A food as one ingredient food, totally unprocessed whole food versus uh, you could go with buying some sort of apple crisp treat off of the shelf that might have 30 different ingredients, which we would consider to be a ultra pro- an ultra processed food. And again, so a lot of people will see on the front of the package, hey, these are organic apple crisps. Very cool. Front of the package doesn't mean anything. It is not the same as an apple. Your body will interpret that absolutely differently. If you can use the processing of food as your number one filter above and beyond absolutely everything else as the input going into your body and try and get more whole foods into your body than ultra processed foods and start making that ratio a little bit better, you will be getting more appropriate feedback from your body. So not just noise. Processed foods give us noise. They mess up. We don't get proper satiation cues. We get extra hunger cues. Um, You'll eat more overall if you're eating nothing but processed foods. And ultimately, health long-term is not going to benefit from that because you're not getting enough nutrients, and you will probably gain weight because you can eat more processed foods than whole foods. The thermic effect of food is something I will speak to here, and it is involved with all of these different inputs that people don't pay attention. So whether your goal is health or weight loss, for example, The thermic effect of food is very, very important. And what that means is there are different foods actually cost a different energetic capacity when you eat them. So if I eat fats, so if I eat 100, if I can break this down, if I eat 100 calories of fats, fats have 0 to 5% thermic effect, which means you're going to get 100 or 95 calories out of that 100. You're going to digest it all. It doesn't take much to digest fats. You're going to get the whole kit and caboodle. Carbohydrates are usually about 10% thermic effect of food. So if you eat 100 calories, you're probably going to absorb about 90, okay? And then if you go to protein, typically the thermic effect is 20 to 30%. So if you had 100 calories, you're only getting 70 to 80% of that, okay? So it makes a massive difference. And processed foods, no matter the macronutrient breakdown, have a lower thermic effect as well. So whole foods, because they contain fiber and they take longer to break down, are also going to have that thermic effect, So especially people who are trying to lose weight and they're just thinking about calories in, based on the type of food, you're actually going to absorb and and use a different number of those calories based on how processed that is. So again, that's a different input that people don't consider when you're stuck to this, I'm just trying to hit my calorie numbers. Well, if you're not considering how processed that food is, you literally are not hitting the numbers you think you're hitting. So it's a really big one to think about that level of processing. And to that point, I mentioned macronutrient content. 
So proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, that's another thing to consider when it comes to foods. Again, protein having a higher thermic effect of food. And again, protein, if you go back to the blog, we just released a blog on this. And protein provides us with important building blocks for our muscle. So again, if you're trying to perform, you're trying to be strong, you're trying to feel good, if you're eating a low protein diet, you're going to have quite a few negative inputs from that whether that be waking, which people don't like, or maybe impaired sleep because your neurotransmitters are not getting enough of the building blocks they need. So there's a lot of different factors there where protein is important, and this, again, going back to the ultra-processing part, watch out for protein bars because as much as it has the name protein in it, it is an ultra-processed food. You're basically eating a chocolate bar with some of the lowest-grade protein added to it. So above and beyond protein, carbs, fats, again, think about how processed is this food. If you can use that as an overriding theme, that is going to be an amazing input for your overall health and goals. Meal timing is another great one. I think I mentioned the diet I was following when things went to crap for me. I was eating everything really, really late. And again, we look at that. It's the insulin response and blood sugar response when you're eating is far, far better in the morning compared to late at night. So we, again, we wrote a circadian rhythms blog. <laughs> so if you go back to that, you can read about how eating late tends to be something that is negative for health and weight gain weight loss long term. Um, thermic effect of food that I just mentioned is better in the morning. So you will better digest foods in the morning than later in the evening where you'll be more prone to packing those away as body fat, which again, for health, is inflammatory, not great. And again, most people are trying to stay at their weight or lose. So again, going back, meal timing is a very important one. Another one is speed of eating and method of eating. So again, for digestion, um, if you're eating really, really fast, this is what tends to flare up things like irritable bowel syndrome or uh, GERD or acid reflux, those types of things. And then method of eating. So I say method of eating, meaning are you eating most of your foods with your hands or are you eating most of your foods on a plate with a knife and fork? Because that plays right back into speed of eating and so if you're paying attention to that input of how am I eating my foods, not just what, by slowing things down, you're going to get better satiation cues. So if you're eating more whole foods and you're eating them slowly off of a plate instead of processed foods with your hand, you will find that whether it's for health or weight loss or whatever you're trying to achieve, that's going to provide you with a much better signaling into the body as opposed to just, again, being stuck on a diet and just trying to hit the numbers that they provide it. And so all of this is not even to mention sleep, quality, quantity that we touched base on before and the impact that that can have on your hunger, satiation cues, and that sort of thing. Same with physical activity and stress management. These are all inputs that dramatically affect your nutrition. And a lot of people will, again, get into that shame-guilt cycle when they feel like they're failing on something because they're trying to hit these specific numbers of a diet and they're not doing it but they're not paying any attention to, you know, are they giving themselves a, a, a fighting chance by going to bed at the right time, getting full restful sleep, and starting the day with a fresh, you know, fresh slate of motivation and, and confidence, right? Um, you really have to consider these other inputs because if you're just focused on the nutrition and you're really burning yourself out with all these other inputs that are happening in life through stress or sleep, then you don't even have a chance to just hit the nutrition, so I think we mentioned the chicken and the egg thing earlier, and that is, that's what we're talking about. You really have to work those dominoes and kind of go back and figure out what are, we, what are we looking at there. So just to quickly summarize that, I mean, for outputs, when you blindly follow rules, it's easy to get impatient with those results and go more extreme with the rules and try and really chase that as opposed to just, like, listening. So when it comes to output, don't just treat the output as a yes, no, black and white answer. So there's a lot of nuance with that. So again, if we want to take weight loss as that output we're trying to achieve, ask yes or no. If it's yes, that's great, but don't forget to check in. Am I feeling okay? Is my digestion okay? Am I mentally like, do I feel okay about this or am I absolutely miserable? Because if all these other outputs <laughs> are really, really negative, that output of trying to lose weight is not going to be something sustainable long term. So you can't just focus on that black and white answer of that one output because there's so many others that impact that one and the sustainability of that. And then if it was a no, for example, then of course I'm not losing weight, but that's when you have to check into those other inputs. So if the output is no, I'm not achieving my goal, it's don't just blame myself. It's actually just kind of go back to that and say, okay, like what am I not taking consideration? Is it the sleep that's negatively impacting that? 
Is it my stress management that's causing me to eat foods you know, mindlessly at certain other points in the day? We'll look back to the other inputs, but you want to use those outputs as that feedback loop to kind of work backwards from there. So to facilitate that, I'm going to go on to my homework now. And the homework that I would like to give people is really just to shape your environment. And so basically what I mean by that is like, this is where you live. So if you take your home environment, for example, this is where you are. So it's conducive to your well-being. Everything else is going to be easier. So when it comes to nutrition, what I mean is, you know, if there's foods in the house that you know you're prone to overeating, just don't keep those in the house. You know, or if they're foods that make you feel unwell, they're bad for your digestion, they hinder your sleep, don't keep them around because they cannot help you with your goals. And if they're there, you're going to eat them because as humans, we do what's easy. And if there's something there we know gives us a quick little dopamine hit is going to make us feel good, we're going to do it even if we know it's going to give us poor sleep or something down the line because we're like, ah, I'll deal with, like, later, Dane, we'll deal with that one. Don't worry about it. I'll do this now. So shaping your environment just makes it easier to, you know, you put the right inputs around you, and that's going to facilitate getting to those outputs. And it's the same thing with sleep. Make your bedroom quiet, dark, cold, <laughs> devoid of technology. Things that, you know, make it easy to have a good input for sleep because then that, again, it dominoes all the right directions. So set your environment, and that's going to make it a lot easier to make sure the right inputs come in and you don't suffer with the poor outputs. To pick up where you left off, for the movement homework, I'm going to cite a recent research study that just came out with the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Studied 40,000 people who'd gotten sick with COVID and determined that one of the key factors, obviously... 48,000 people are not, that's not a homogenous group of people. <laughs> it's varied ages and so on. But what they did find is that the people who did not suffer to the degree of needing to go to the hospital or ICU were ones who met the minimum amount of physical activity recommended per week. Now, if you're not familiar with that, that's 150 minutes in North America, which isn't that much. We'd actually much prefer that people are able to drip feed in a little bit more here and there. But it did show that at least the people who were m hitting that bare minimum or that recommendation were the ones who were counteracting the worse, worse effects of, of COVID. So that was interesting to bring attention to that. And I know that a lot of us in the health and wellness and fitness space have been struggling this past year because a lot of people, a lot of the people that we serve are limited in their output now. And they're limited, whether it's because of the country that they're in, placing restrictions, or they're at home and isolated and don't have space to do much, but are uh, concerned about going outside, particularly because of the way outside has been presented up till this point in time. And that's challenging because we know <laughs> that the best way to uphold your health and your immunity is to get a dose of movement every day. What I'll encourage you do for the homework this week is you look at your daily movement doses, and I don't necessarily mean exercise. I mean any little movement snacks you might have throughout your day. And a movement snack is anything within your capacity. If you can't walk, that's fine. A movement snack can involve changing levels within your home, doing some ground-based stuff and I spend a lot of time lying on my back <laughs> rolling around in in here because it relieves my spine and my shoulders from more static postures. You can pace around your home while you're on a phone call. Anything that additively gives your body a little bit more of a stimulus. We spoke about lit to hit last week, so low intensity interval training uh, versus high. And the high is like the structured exercise, the Tabata, whatever it is. And that will be a smaller portion of your overall week, almost like a pyramid now. Whereas the lit should be kind of every single day. It doesn't take long to decondition. It takes two days and you'll already lose 10% of your lung capacity, two days of rest. So sometimes if you're worried about having the energy for something, so you keep resting, you actually need to flip the script because in order to sustain our powerhouses, our mitochondria, obviously our, our cardiovascular capacity, we need that movement and it does not have to be a high output structured exercise. It can also be that. But even if you're somebody who exercises, the homework is still the same. 
what are the other movement doses? Where are your other movement snacks? Whether that's mobility work, whether it's just doing a few squats here and there, whether it's going up and down the stairs for a minute, whatever it is, how many of those do you have every day? And if you have under four, can you add a few more? They don't have to be long. It honestly can be as simple as doing 30 seconds of one exercise every single hour to open up your chest or counterbalance a sitting posture. So pick your various movements, try to get as much variability, and count how many of those little movement snacks you have throughout your day and see if you can naturally add a little bit more. That is excellent homework. Probably cut that part out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you, Freya. That's great. Now, I think one last thing to touch on before we get to the recap is just the sustainability piece um, of these habits. And I think we've both kind of touched base on this, but it, the big key is just to not overhaul your life. So when you're trying to improve your health, don't change a million things at once. Change one input at a time. Focus in on that one input at a time um, and focus on that. What can help with that is also tracking. So again, tracking forever. Some people, you know, will track their food intake with my fitness pal just forever for no reason, aimlessly. It's that's not what we're talking about. It's just tr if you're going to focus on one thing, track that to see where you're at. Do it for a week, maybe two, and then leave it away and try and keep it going. And then you can reset to the tracking again if you feel like ah oh, maybe I'm not where I was. Um, but you do want to pay attention and keep some sort of track until it feels like it is habitual and you get to that place. And then you can move on to the next thing. And the tracking here is information gathering. Mm -hmm. If you notice that you have a tendency to have low energy on certain days of the week, backtrack and, or sorry, start tracking and then look at it. So you can analyze was my sleep on point, some of the other points that we've talked about in previous podcasts. But the tracking should be to collect data points to create a more full picture of what is going on. And we do find that tracking can sometimes be recommended, but it's not recommended along with the ability to give yourself objective feedback. And that's where it can start to feel just like really task heavy. You shouldn't have to tr track and be rigid your entire life. It serves a purpose. And anytime you notice that something's not going right, you can't observe what it is, then you start tracking again. For me, I track sleep. Uh, I have my resting heart rate and my temperature in the morning thanks to a handy device so I don't have to measure those things separately. And for me, that has provided me a lot of helpful information over the years. But we don't want people to become obsessive and now start tracking and this app or piece of paper is now a representation of you as a human and determines everything. The purpose of it is always to get objective feedback and when you're done measuring, you feel like things are trending really well, then stop it, retire that. Pick it up again if you feel that things aren't going well. It should always be there as a tool that you can lean on but that doesn't dictate your life. Amazing. So, quick recap of today's podcast is that general thing is inputs beget outputs. So we become the net result of our chronic inputs and behaviors. So if your incomes, um, so if your outcomes <laughs> aren't what you want, start challenging those inputs. Understand that this is often a chicken and egg thing and habits play off of one another. So healthy habits support one another and unhealthy habits tend to lead to more unhealthful behaviors and coping mechanisms. So the, co so the homework for the week was, again, to build in some movement into your day. So check movement snacks. Try and get up to 10, but build a little bit more movement into your day to get up to that recommended amount of movement in a day for optimal health. And on the nutrition side of things, shape your environment. Shape your environment to facilitate the inputs that will serve you and make it harder to continue with habits that are not serving you. So that's it for this week. Uh, next week, we have a special guest host, so you get a break from this guy. Probably looking forward to that. Uh, and we will set the focus around EDS and hypermobility spectrum disorders with more of a frequently asked questions episode with our resident in-house expert, Freya Spence. So, and the emotional support our giraffe. Our emotional support <laughs> giraffe, Taylor Oaks, <laughs> will be replacing Dean Wallace as the host. <laughs> So look forward to that, a break for me, two lovely ladies on camera, and uh, learning a little bit more about EDS. So thank you very much for tuning in, and we will see you next time on the Move Daily Health Podcast.
We hope you enjoyed our conversation. To hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Move Daily Health Podcast. And don't hesitate to leave us a review. Thanks for listening.